me just, this is the slide we left on. Amazingly, it's where we're gonna pick up right now. So we're trying this, this is how really it would be better if I did all the time. But, uh, so here we go. The fact that this chesed, now Sunday night did a whole sermon about this attribute of God and the subtle and beautiful way that it's highlighted in the unique way that it's highlighted in, in the book of Ruth. Um, so I, I'll refer you to that at the website if you want to listen to more of that. And at the end of class Sunday, we did touch on this, that it's never directly ascribed to God in the book like it is in Psalms. You know, the Lord is merciful and gracious and abounding in hesed, it's steadfast love, abounding in covenant love. Um, we see it in, and I gave several examples, so the, just to make sense of this slide, we see it not only in the major characters, Ruth to Naomi and Boaz to, and Naomi to Ruth, I pointed out Sunday. You can, put, you can do that both ways. In fact, just for a reminder to myself, let me do this. Uh, and you see it, you could say as well, Boaz to Ruth and Ruth to Boaz both. So we can, it goes both ways, really. I, I did a little bit more. Uh, I did elaborate it a little more Sunday night in the sermon, but also in the minor characters, in the way the township m m gives this wish to Ruth that she would prosper like Rachel and Tamar. And they talk about these women they revere in their own history, and they say that's what they want. The book is so full of everyone wishing well for everyone else. This is why it's such a joy to read and so edifying because it's it's really a, an idyllic presentation of God's covenant community where everyone acknowledges the Lord. The Lord is on the lips of the characters and they openly express their faith you know, frequently. I'm not very good at that. Have you ever been around someone who is the Lord everything, the Lord this, the Lord that, every other word out of their mouth is the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. Sometimes this makes you almost a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and Kim worked in a Baptist uh, private Christian school that our kids attended in Mississippi and and the office staff there you know would do that a lot and sometimes you felt like well, maybe I'm not a, a very good Christian because I'm not always saying well you know the Lord you know well yeah we we the it, the Lord you know made sure we got you know this and that or that uh, uh, and the other well in the in the book of Ruth I, I don't believe you have to do that to be a faithful Christian but you see that beautifully in the book and in the way the people treat Ruth. And what's so remarkable about that is not only was it a time in Israel of, of uh, moral degeneration, and it was a time of appalling uh, moral relativism and, uh, and uh, abandonment of God and corruption of the worship of God and indulgent. In, indulgence and evil and all of that. So that makes it remarkable. But let's think about the Moabites for a minute. Their, their God was Chemosh, and he's identified that way several times in Scripture. And then we found historical, in the Moabite stone, the Moab, Moabites, right? They're the descendants of, through Abraham's nephew, Lot, He his daughters got him drunk and fornicated with him. This is how bad Sodom, let's talk about the Canaanization of Israel, what, as we saw in the book of Judges, well, apparently when he set his tent toward Sodom, his family paid a price uh, from being in that cultural environment because who would even think to do that, right? But the result of that is the Ammonites, uh, the descendants of his daughters are the Ammonites and the Moabites. Well, when the Moabite stone was discovered, you see on the, on the, the well, this is a close-up image of some of the text. This was a remarkable find because it corroborated certain things that biblical critics said were not real in the Bible, like King David. They said outside the Bible there's never any reference to King David. He's a mythical character, and there's no historical corroboration. Well, the Moabite stone, about 800 B.C., it dates to, speaks of... Uh, the kingdom of Israel and it makes reference to also those who think Genesis was written very late after Israel was in exile uh, because the word Yahweh is used and the word Yahweh wasn't used at that time. Well the Moabite stone there's a line in the Moabite stone right here um, and it's 
it's blown up here where you can see the name Yahweh because the king of Moab is boasting how he, uh, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, defeated Israel and their god Yahweh. There, this it has tremendous historical significance in corroborating the historical accuracy of the Bible. But it's from Moab. This is a Moabite stone, and their god is Chemosh, and they perform child sacrifice. 2 Kings 3.27 might be a little bit hard for you to see that. 2 Kings 3.27. Let me do this. Can I zoom it? Let's see. Yes. Okay. Um, 2 Kings 3.27, in battle with Israel that, that the Moabites lost, the king sacrificed his own son to Chemosh. Um, there we see the conflict with Israel going all the way back to in in Numbers 22 20 through 25. You remember it was Barak, king of the Moabites, wanted Balaam, the seer, this man who claimed to be have some kind of prophetic vision, uh, wanted him to curse. Remember the idea of cursing carried weight in people's minds in the ancient Near East. And he wanted them to curse Israel. And instead, God used Balaam to give uh, several prophecies blessing Israel. And instead, we learn from other passages later that he advised Barak how to get Israel cursed. So how did they do that? He led, they led them into uh, their, their uh, reveling to their God, the festival, the feast to their God, where it involved fornication. And so they were punished by God because they were fornicating with the Moabites, with the Moabites. So there was already conflict there. And because of that, in Deuteronomy 23, no Moabite, even though the law made provisions for sojourners to worship and attach themselves to Israel, as long as they kept Israel's law, by the way, um, no Moabite, because of what happened in Numbers, no Moabite would be allowed in the assembly where the people would worship at holy times at the tabernacle for 10 generations. So there's a, cur there's a curse from God on the Moabite. Now, don't, don't you think this would build up in your mind a, a sort of attitude like the Jews had toward the Gentiles in the time of Jesus where uh, the, they, they would, or, or toward the Samaritans. You remember when Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman? The Jews would actually take a circuitous route to go around Samaria when they were going from the south to the north just to avoid passing through Samaria. And then James and John said to Jesus, when, when one village wouldn't even let Jesus and his disciples stay there because they could tell they were heading toward Jerusalem. We're not going to help these Jews on their journey to Jerusalem. And so remember James and John said, you want us to rain down fire? Want us to pray to the Lord to rain down fire and destroy them all? Because that's the way they thought of the Samaritans. Wouldn't you think you'd be thinking this way toward the Moabites? They're pagans. They worship this God. They engage in child sacrifice. And in this period right here, this text in Judges 3, Eglon, remember, king of the Moabites. They were oppressed by the Moabites during a, a certain part. We're not told if this was during the time of Ruth. We don't get any indication of that. But Ehud, remember, <coughs> drew, uh, drove, uh, uh, drew his sword and drove it into uh, Eglon and killed him on his, in, in his own palace and, and all of that. And then later Solomon, to his shame, Later, Solomon in 1 Kings 11 built an altar. Because he married foreign women, he built an altar to Chemosh. Solomon! King Solomon. David finally defeats them where we don't read of them molesting Israel after that so much. In Jehoshaphat, there's a really fascinating chapter in 2 Chronicles 20 about a, a battle where God intervenes supernaturally and, and gives them victory over the uh, Moabites and Josiah as well. So in their, in their previous history, in their subsequent history, we're going to see the Mo there's all this conflict with the Moabites and they're a pagan people and they worship a pagan, uh, they worship a false god and uh, they're polytheists. They have many gods, but their their national deity was Chemosh, uh, Chemosh, and so Ruth comes from Moab, and Abimelech takes his wife and and boys to Moab to to live to get food and sojourn, and then Naomi. This bothers me, and when we get to it, we'll talk about it. But she actually tells. After Orpah leaves and goes back 
and she tells Ruth, you go back with your sister-in-law to your people and your gods. Chapter 1, verse 15, I think it is. Is it, is it verse 15? To your gods. Why would Naomi, why wouldn't she say, come with me and worship the true God? I think the Israelites were so influenced by the the canonization of Israel at this time, they still had this henotheistic idea. That is, each nation had its patron national deity. Ours is Yahweh, and you have yours. Go back to yours. Like, your church is good as mine. You go to your church, I'll go to mine. Never, matter, never mind what they teach or how they practice, whether it's right or biblical. Everybody just pick a god, pick a religion. pick a, That influenced Naomi, I think. Um, Interesting to consider whether, let's see if that, no, if that will reset for me. Oh, I, I love this app. You just don't know the Forecast happiness I get. Turn the game off, Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> or at least mute your phone so we don't know you're watching. All right, now, 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 Peggy, will you share with the class what I was just talking about? <laughs> Block the image. <laughs> Hey, I would totally be following the box score right now if I, if I were sitting there. So you can multitask. You can follow the score and still uh, engage in class uh, like we do with a lot of things. When I was a kid, we had one of the elders' wives was a big Reds fan. And she would listen with the microphone. With and the occasionally little... she would get excited during, during church. Oh, yeah. I know, I've, heard of, I've heard of people watching soccer, which is a real thing, you know, that in New York, back home, soccer was a much bigger deal than it is down here but like when the world cup was on which is a which is take the hype over the world series and the super bowl combine it and multiply it by a hundred that's what the world cup means to the nations outside of uh it, outside of in uh, the u.s and in north america and they'd be sitting in the assembly also you know go you know somebody jump up uh I mean, praise the Lord. <laughs> so this, it's a this sportsization of uh, religion. Yeah, it's the whole. That's uh, you're making up words like I am. That's good. <laughs> Sportification or sport of sport athleticization. Oh, okay. So they. What, what does tell? What does that tell you then? How about how we should judge cultures and people? If Ruth is such a incredible, good, and godly person. Now, the Moabites are condemned as a culture. You can have cultural practices. There are cultures right now that practice female genital mutilation. Those are bad cultures. Those are cultures where they mutilate little girls so they won't have sexual pleasure, uh, and it's supposed to stop them from cheating on their husbands when they're grown. It's excruciatingly painful. It's barbaric to the core, and it's practiced in certain cultures. Now, we can rightfully say that is a cultural environment that is poisonous and, and evil in its worldview and the way the worldview uh, play, plays out in their treatment of each other. Remember we said you see it especially in the treatment of women and children, how they suffer the most. Um, however, does that mean everybody that's in that community is that way? It might be someone like Ruth in that community who could be converted to Christ, converted to the God of Israel, to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we can, my point is, on the people will get it wrong, I think, both ways. Of course, I always have it just right. Uh, I'm not trying to say I get it exactly right. I may get it wrong myself. But in my view, people get it wrong, my opinion, that on the one hand, they'll see a good person in a culture and they'll say you shouldn't be judging this culture or this trend or this you know whatever because I know somebody who's a good person and okay that may be true but this but what's going on in that culture is still bad <laughs> right but on the other hand people can be too broad and say well this is a bad culture and then therefore you come from that culture you're bad and because everybody in it's bad that it, right can you can't you err in either direction um, Ruth is, it's amazing that they they receive her, they appreciate her because they judge her based on her individual character and not where she came from and what her people were like.
but they saw her behavior. See, don't you want to be judged that way? Right? So, uh, you know, you, get, you run into that kind of thing with the French don't like Americans now, you know, and you're from America, you might feel like you've been in a restaurant and they're kind of, they think you're a jerk and, uh, uh, and maybe you think they're rude or whatever. But then you meet an individual American who's a really likable guy. You say, well, you know what, I shouldn't uh, be so quick to think that way. Of course, the French are all jerks anyway. So let, let's just move on. Um, see what I did there? This being silly. That, uh, that, uh, so um, that's the kind of attitude I think we should, shouldn't have. And uh, Ruth, the, the covenant love, the steadfast love, that term, is all the more amazing in the way that it's demonstrated even toward a Moabite woman who ends up being brought by God into the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. And some think the book of Ruth was written to justify a Moabite bloodline in the Davidic dynasty. Like people would question the Davidic rule, David's dynasty, and say it's corrupted. It's not true, genuine line. If you follow back his lineage, he has a Moabite woman. His great, his grandfather's great grandfather is married to this Moabite woman. But you, you go to the Book of Ruth and you see she was more faithful to Yahweh than a lot of the Israel's own people. And so we said one of the themes of Ruth can be the inclusion of the Gentiles, a foreshadowing of the inclusion of the Gentiles in God's ultimate purpose. So we're said we're going to see God's hidden hand of providence at work, even though he's scarcely mentioned only twice by the narrator. And do you remember the two places I mentioned if you were here Sunday night uh, in chapter 1, verse 6? Uh, he visited his people with bread, and then when Ruth conceived, is it chapter 4, verse 13? Uh, verse 13, the Lord gave her conception, right? Other than that, it never says the Lord did this, the Lord said that. It's always on the mouth of the characters. So what's fascinating about it, I'll get to that in the literary features in a moment, is that God is portrayed working providentially through natural events like the famine, uh, what appears to be happenstance. That's a big point. I'm going to preach a separate lesson on that. Through the delicate, this is the way one, one uh, writer put it, and it's so unique I would never say it that way, so I put it in quotes to give him credit. But Ruth's scheming uh, to Ruth's plan, to Naomi's plan, to have Ruth do something quite unorthodox and radical and go to the threshing floor and basically propose to that, that is amazing that that even happened. And it's right there in the Bible. Through the legal processes, I mentioned this some rapidly Sunday morning at the end of class, but the, uh, they still have to go through the customs of the day, and God can work through all of that as well. And this was the point of the sermon right here, through the loving kindness and faithfulness uh, of his people. And in the choices that they're making day to day that seem very ordinary and not uh, anything divinely directed, but God's using those choices. And, and that's why I want to give a lesson later about how encouraging that is. All right, so we're still looking at themes and theology in Ruth. Another one that is typically pointed out over and over when you read any material on Ruth is the idea of the Redeemer, the kinsman, the kinsman Redeemer in Ruth. Um, and it's the word, you hear it all the time, goel. There's the Hebrew word, and it's translated in a, in a lot of versions like right there as the kinsman redeemer, meaning meaning someone who's related to you, your kin, who is obligated according to partially the law of Moses, but also there were customs associated with in Israel that are not a part of the law, that are in Ruth, that the people just, it's, it's another layer they added to it, um, where you are obligated to, if a man man died and and he was left without a male heir or childless, that uh, someone in the family had to go to that woman, take her, bear children through her, and then the the child born would inherit what that what the dead man's rights would have been so that the family line can continue. And so that was considered a way of sort of redeeming what would be lost to a person when a male heir died and the family line would die out. And so this redeemer, first of all, he's a kinsman, so he's related, and he 
performs a, an act of redemption. Now, can, can we not see... Now, I'm not saying an, an, an Israelite in the Old Testament period would imagine this has any reference to the Messiah. And we don't want to over-allegorize, as I say all the time when we read the Old Testament, but we do want to read Christologically, as Jesus teaches us to do. Jesus in Luke 24 says the Old Testament is about him. Everything, the, the, the law and the prophets and the Psalms, everything must be fulfilled concerning me. So he is the goal and the point of the telos, the end of uh, all that is in Scripture. And Christ is our kinsman. He took on flesh to become like one of us. And he is our redeemer. I think that concept absolutely uh, embodies, if it's not prophetic, is intended to be a, a type foreshadowing Jesus. It certainly is uh, parallel to or comparable to what Jesus does. And this... Um, Redemption that Ruth experienced is represented in some, some great contrast in the book. The, a reversal of conditions. Redemption results in, uh, uh, instead of death, life. So there's a contrast with the living and the dead. There's a contrast between you know, trying to find rest and actually finding it. Seeking rest, but then when redemption occurs, she finds, they find rest being bitter as opposed to being pleasant. Naomi's name, she says, call me Mara or bitter. There's a, there, you find these contrasts in the book. Don't call me Naomi anymore, it's bitter. I what things were pleasant, but now I'm bitter. There's this literary uh, uh, device of contrast, full versus empty that you see from the beginning and the end of the book. So we'll look for that kind of thing. As, as we go through the book. But the Goel, the, the kinsman redeemer, is very, very important. All right, so the last thing as far as introduction goes are some things I've already talked about, hinted at, suggested along the way, is the literary features. Remember we said the relationship, in fact, I don't have a slide on this, uh, but we could show that um, we know there's a connection, and I keep saying this, so uh, I'm, I'm repeating it intentionally, not because I've forgotten that I said it, but not only do we learn from what is told, but the way that it's told. If we're paying attention to the literary features of a text, it allows God, listen, this would be a good way to say it. I should have wrote it up here. Tweet this, Rose, okay? Do you have your phone? Um, it allows God to make a bigger impact to allow the text to make a bigger impact on you. So when you see the way the story is being told, God, I think God is actually be, in the beauty of the literature itself. It's making an, a more powerful impact on your spirit. I didn't say that very concisely, but I think you, you can see the idea. The Bible impacts us not just because it's what is said. Everything the Bible says, it could just say, line by line in, in propositions. But the Bible isn't a list of propositions about God. It's a story, right? And we learn and are emotionally impacted by the story and, and by the poetry of the story. When Ruth gives that great statement to Naomi, don't, don't entreat me to leave you or go back for following. Where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. That's poetry. Well, it's a very emotional scene. How are we going to get that across to the reader? We're not there to watch it like in a film, to see her pulling on her and crying and all the weeping and the scene is, is very powerful. You, but poetry impacts your spirit in a way prose does not. And so that's a feature of the literature where it's Ruth's steadfast love toward Naomi is related in a way that makes a more powerful impact when it's said that way. That's important to pay attention to that. And since this is a more advanced class, what I mean is we're not just looking at the text. We're, in fact, a lot of times we're not looking at the text itself. We're talking about the text because we're assuming you're familiar with the basic text. Now we're going beyond that. So this is going beyond that. All right, you can read the story and know the story, but now we're talking about, well, what are ways we're seeing in the text? Like the repetition of terms in chapter 1, the word return is used 12 times. I think that's intentional. Uh, it's trying to tell us something, and then it's used again at the end of the book. Wow. Talk about tying together a story. This is a masterpiece. It's been called a masterpiece 
of narrative art as far as the beauty of the book. And in fact, there's another quote I want that I didn't put up there. Not only one, one scholar said, there's no poet in the world has written a more beautiful short story. And the other statement is, it's the loveliest complete work on a small scale ever constructed. That's the way this book has impacted scholars who read it in Hebrew and who are familiar with other works of ancient literature and they read the book of Ruth and they say, wow. See, people don't know that about the Bible, how superior the Bible is as a literary work, even if you don't believe a word of it. Uh, but of course, we know it's true. It's very densely packed, so as you know, I can make these four chapters last forever because there's so much uh, in them. Very densely packed. It's also interesting that it's written more from a woman's perspective, and you have a book in the Bible that's not only uh, about, in part, a character who's not a Jew, uh, not an Israelite, but the, the book is named after this Moabite woman, and we're getting all the women's perspective. She goes, she tells the girls, she tells her daughters-in-law, go back to your mother's house. And we're seeing how the famine and how loss of, of a husband, how when a man dies, when, when someone's son dies, how it affects a woman. We want to look for that. Of course, it's a classic love story between Ruth and Boaz, and it's classified as a tale or short story, not a not a, okay, once upon a time, like a fairy tale, but it's in a class of literature we would call an idol. Uh, that's a term, not I-D-O-L or I-D-L-E, although it's pronounced like that, but idyll or idyll is something presented in a highly idealistic way so that you're reading through the story and, and Boaz workers love him and bless him and Boaz... Uh, it's good to his workers and in every scene people are acting in a way that is ideal so it also gives uh, a beautiful picture of pastoral life of when people see Ruth if you google pictures of Ruth you usually see her with wheat right she's out she's beating the or she's holding a, a sheaths or picking up she pieces that are left over from the workers and there's all these customs that are related to agrarian, the hard, the difficulties and the joys of agrarian life. It's so foreign to us in the modern Western world where we don't even see how our food is made and grown and slaughtered and, and uh, it's all made for us and packaged and then we just show up and get it. Well, here you see it's highly idyllic in the way it presents, you know, this pastoral life. But if we pay close attention, you see how, how, what, how hard it is, the, that kind of life. And women having to go out and work all day in the fields and still do what they do at home. Um, the, notice, uh, this is the point I was making earlier. I forgot that I put it on the next slide. That um, the literary features help us see something about God. It helps the text make a bigger impact on us. For example, right here, this first point, that that Yahweh, as we said, is only mentioned in chapter 1, 6, 4, 13, but the characters are constantly talking about it. So that's the way the writer is showing God to us through these people. And the hidden hand of God, we sort of read between the lines. That's what I talked about Sunday night in the lesson as well. So all of that, let's get to the key passages in the book. I think it's chapter 1, 16 and 17 that I've already quoted in part several times and we'll look at when we get there, but I would mark that down where Ruth begs Naomi not to leave her and it's this great statement. I might even preach a sermon on it Sunday night, but it's this great statement of devotion that is characteristic of the kind of love that God has for us. It's so beautiful. Chapter 3, the reason I would include chapter 3 verses 9 and 10 is because of that reference to uh, let's read that because that's not as familiar to us. Chapter 3, 9 and 10, where Boaz said, she says, uh, he said, who are you? This is in this proposal, this unusual thing for a woman to show up at the threshing floor in the middle of the night, which is very scandalous that he was found with a woman in the middle of the night and uncovers his feet. So bizarre to us, but it's like pulling off the bed covers and saying, I am willing for you to take me into your bed as your wife. Uh, and that's what you do when you're married. So um, 
that's basically a way of proposing. And it's pretty bold for in that period for a woman to propose to a man. So listen to what she says. I'm Ruth, your servant. And he says, spread your, she, uh, spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. There's that word. You are the goel. And he said, may you be blessed by the Lord. There's one of those times. Blessing. Pe people are getting blessing, uh, are, have blessings wished upon them over and over in the book. May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter, for you've made this lap. Notice she, he's considerably older, my daughter. <coughs> Do we, do we have any couples like that here where there's a big age difference? We, we, I've always known some in every congregation where I've been. Yeah. Like with me, and Kim, I'm so much younger than Kim. It's, just, it's so weird. <laughs> so you have this, la you've made this last kindness. I'm not saying she's old, but it didn't work at all. She's did it? Also okay. absent. I'm retracting that. <laughs> she's not here. Uh, you've made this last chesed, there it is, greater than the first, and that you've not gone after men, whether rich or poor. It links the Redeemer idea of go well in the same verse as the chesed of God, that love. And then the, at the end, the reason I say chapter 4 verses 18 through 22 at the end of the book is the genealogy that surprises us after you read this beautiful story. Then all of a sudden we get a genealogy that links it to David the king. So that's very important to understand. That is why the story is so relevant to us, not just because it's beautiful and touching and tender and powerful in other ways, but it, what it's linking to where it fits in the Bible story. That it's part of the big picture. This little story is a part of God's story, the big story, just like your story is. That's what we'll talk about. But in chapter 2, verse 3, here's a little surprising one I'm going to throw in there, okay? Uh, you would never read, I don't think you would read this verse normally and think this is a verse that's a key verse in the Bible of any book. And yet, uh, there's a little phrase I want you to mark there where it says, So she set out and went on and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened. Does your Bible say she happened? No. And it turned out. That's the way uh, uh, several translations render it. And, 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 and as it turned out, she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. She happened? She just happened to come to a field with a man like this, Boaz, who also is a Kimson Redeemer, who happens to be available and willing to redeem her, and it just worked out that she came to that field. I think, as I've said several times, that's ironic, and it's supposed to convey to us that what what seemed can seem to be happen chance in our happenstance or chance in our lives can be God can be either orchestrating those providentially, or if not, because I don't know that, I don't know if God made sure I got stationed in Bergstrom in Austin so that I could meet the guy who taught me the gospel. I might have met somebody else if I'd have been stationed in California or somewhere. Um, but talk about the Canaanites, right? What if I'd have been in the Canaanite culture out in California? Uh, well, uh, I could have met, and I might have met a, a godly wife there. Uh, you know, I don't know. But it could be that when I decided to join the Air Force and whoever's making those decisions sent me to that base and she's there at that time, I don't know. I let. I just trust God working His ultimate purpose in my story and in her story. But it's so intriguing to think that who knows that day I walked in there and met her. Jamie met her husband in Virginia. He just happened to be there. Her his daddy doing a, a job in the area, so they came and visited services one night. He walks in the door. He's a handsome man. Our daughter. I mean Jacob. So. Okay, but Jamie's husband is a looker. Uh, he turns heads. He's a real gorgeous uh, young guy, and he walked in the in the door that night. It's like Jamie, you need, we need to go talk to this uh, guy. She knew him from camp from years ago, and, and when we were in Mississippi, and thought we'd never never see him again when they were little. And so think of your life that way, and it really, really is intriguing, isn't it? to think about God could be using he could be bringing you into those situations or you may, just may be making choices I'll take this job I'll turn that one down I get stationed here I get moved here but God can be using those things to work out what he wants in your life so here's an outline of the book I can talk all night about that and I will in another sermon so um, this is the way I break down the book. I'll give you this material if you want. Mainly what I want you to notice, though, is it breaks down really well as far as uh, a four-act play where each chapter is basically another act in the drama. 
uh, because it is a story. And then I want you to see this, that it basically follows this pattern of there's a crisis that's introduced and then there's a, whoops, let's see, down one there. There's a crisis that introduced, is introduced after the beginning and then there's a resolution, but then that leads to another crisis which leads to an even greater resolution. So there's a cycle that sort of escalates and might be represented this way. Again, I didn't have these in the one I already sent out, but if you want these. Where after the introduction, we go down here to the first crisis. Ah, oh, there's a problem. We're concerned. What's going to happen? Then there's a, a nice resolution. But once Boaz accepts the proposal, there's another crisis, though. Someone else has a right to marry Ruth before him. Wow. Wow. So all this falls into place, but he might not get to marry her after all. So there's another crisis in its resolution that takes us to a, a, a high point there. So I think that's a good way, and you'll see a chart sometimes sort of like that if you are looking up uh, the introductory material on the Book of Ruth. Okay, any question or comment about all of that? It is a hallmark movie. Doesn't it seem that way? All right. Didn't did they kiss and it snows? Right. Like, see here. Let's. Right. <laughs> Not only do they kiss, they kiss with the picture with the tree behind. The lights are behind them, and they're blurry in the background. <laughs> and then it just starts to snow. Uh, you notice nobody wants palm trees in their Christmas story, right? Um, they were filming on Hawaii. In Hawaii, there's going to be a there's going to be a warm weather one. That's going to be weird. I don't know if I'm going to be on board for that. But, but after the fourth or fifth time I watch it, I'll let you know. What? It's kind of strange though that Ruth uncovers his feet, so he's got cold feet, but he still goes to heaven. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Even I, I'm pretty corny, but I have my limits. So. Oh, that, that's a nice turn of phrase there. Um, I'm here to make you look good. Okay, but since, uh, we'll be here all week. Jim will be here all week. Please tip your waitresses. Um, this, uh, the, all right, now think about why are the Hallmark movies all exactly the same? Basically, you know, everyone's, it starts off the, one, the Christmas ones. She's a designer, or she's a publisher, or she's a journalist. It's like, well, how come nobody's ever like a waitress, or uh, you know, works uh, in uh, retail, or something like that? Okay, there's one with wait. There's one I wear of a waitress from like 20 years ago, one of the older ones. But almost all of the newer ones. I'm exaggerating them a little bit. Almost all the newer ones uh, that I've seen over the last several years, once I got a little bit hooked on them, is um, are there there there's some kind of uh, ad agency on an ad campaign for a product, and the product's usually a tech product. It's all hot, upper middle class. Well, well, but why is it? Why are they so much alike? Why are they just basically changing characters and following the same plot line? They're as predictable. As Rose, yes. I just I didn't have anything there, so Rose, you were right there, rock solid. Because it works, people like it. It makes you feel good, right? But it's the pattern is the same thing. Boy meets girl. There's a little tension at first, but ah, oh, of course, there's a little rub. They bump into so each other. Gorgeous. You're rude Both to me. Them. They're always gorgeous, and they're always middle-aged and so unmarried. Gorgeous. Where are all these good-looking middle-aged yeah, unmarried people in their 30s <laughs> who just never found a guy and for some reason don't love Christmas anymore because mom died uh, on Christmas Day? Uh, wait, is that, is that the first or second bell? First. First. Oh, wait, you can't leave yet. So, uh, and, and so this person brings them around to love Christmas again and blah 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 so that's one of the five different basically storylines they have but then there's a second crisis right after they love each other but then she sees him hugging his old his ex-girlfriend at, at the party but she doesn't stop to ask who it is right and you find out later yeah it's his sister or uh, he was wishing her well because she's engaged to somebody else now and they're saying goodbye forever but she saw them and so there's a second crisis 
The book of Ruth follows that pattern. It follows that pattern. So there's a second issue to create more drama because if it was just if it was just boy meets girl and the story, uh, it's not very interesting, right? Well, this is true. This is real life, but that's how the story was told. Uh, how the story was related in the book of Ruth. So any other question or comment as far as introduction goes? Well, what gets me too is that never did, a lot of them didn't fall in love. I mean, they were just there. I mean, bam, they got married. Yeah, they're just there. Okay. Yeah. All right, look, do this, do this. Go, go to chapter one, verse one, so we can say we did. I'll give you that. I can email that to anyone who wants it. All right, here, here we go, here we go. Uh, let me get rid of the dots real quick. All right. Um, look, look how it starts here. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So in the days, it doesn't start out once upon a time, right? <laughs> it grounds the story in a real time and place, Bethlehem. And when? In the days of the judges. <clears throat> because some people treat the book of Ruth because it is so ideal. They say, well, this didn't really, I mean, happen like that. It's, it, it's, it's just meant to make the Israelites feel good about David's lineage. But surely this wasn't a real thing that happened. Well, this is how the story is told. And this opening paragraph grounds us in the events. First of all, uh, chronologically, it's showing you the time. And historically uh, and geographically, it gives us the chronology. It's during the time of the judges. Historically, we find from the epilogue how it is tied in with the greater Bible story. Geographically, it's in Bethlehem of Judah. And personally, in that it's identifying the key characters, all this in the opening paragraph. And, and so notice how concise this is. And also, I might add, uh, theologically, because it tells us, there was a famine in the land. Now, uh, when the famine ends in verse 6, it says the Lord visited his people with breath, not bread. Now, there's an irony. Bethlehem means baked, uh, means house of lechem, the house of bread. There's no bread in the house of bread. Uh, and they leave. Why would there be a famine in the land? Um, wasn't there one time in, in the judges where the rule, the ruling country was taking everything that the Israelites grew? Yes, it was. Uh, uh, when no, the, he was, it, they started because there was a famine in the land. Yeah, they it was the Moabites were among the the. Let me let me check because you're absolutely right. Where they were waiting until harvest time and coming and taking all the crops, and so that's when Gideon, no Gideon, yeah, the Gideon and the Midianites. Gideon, Gideon was. Uh, uh, called then to he's having to beat out the thresh out the wheat in the in the wine press because he's hiding from the Midianites. So, uh, but notice in Deuteronomy 11 in, Deut in Leviticus 26, part part of the blessings of the covenant where God says, "I will make the rains from heaven come down, and your land will be fertile and rich, and, and your crops will be abundant." But then in Leviticus, look at look at the look at the contrast here, and the curses. God will make the heavens like steel. He'll make it close them up and there will be no rain. Uh, Deuteronomy 28, 23 through 24, they were told explicitly that if they did not keep the covenant, that he would make the land desolate and, the, and bring famine. And so one of the ways God's judging him in the period of the judges, I think, is not just through oppression by their enemies, but what he told them would happen. If they went after other gods, there would be famine. But God can use even what he, I think then, the suggestion is he caused it. But remember, God used the famine in Joseph's day to, uh, and he used Joseph's mistreatment by his brothers to get Jacob and the people of Israel, the, the, the people, the family, the core family that becomes Israel in the land of Egypt. Now, let's finish with Psalm 105. So look at Psalm 105. This is where we're finished. Notice... Uh, and then we can check the scores. Remember, some people are recording it, though, so I guess we got to... Give us 45 seconds to get out. Get out the door. Uh, 
I have it in a text I want to pull up here. Here, Psalm 106 looks back to when there was famine in, in uh, Israel's history. In Psalm 105, verse 16. 105, did I have the wrong Psalm? Yeah, 105, verse 16. When he summoned a famine in the land and broke all supply of bread. So when we're reading Genesis, we don't see God causing this famine. But sure enough, that's what happened. He sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. And then down in verse 23, then Israel came to Egypt. So God worked in this circumstance. So that's one of the providential things we see. God can cause or and or work in these tragic, hard situations in life. And he does. And he can still work that out to his ultimate glory. Isn't that an encouraging thought too? So even in the first sentence, there's a whole bunch of theology right here already. So we started, Ruth. We started chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, we got through part of verse 1. We can go right to the text Sunday, Lord willing. Okay, go Astros, in case anybody's watching this later on the internet. Game 2 of the World Series tonight.